Well, good morning. My name is Adam, one of the pastors. Delighted to have you here with us. And uh, if you are new, we're going through a brand new topical series called I'm With You, uh, what the promises of God have to say about suffering in our lives. And, uh, you know, typically our diet is to go verse by verse through books of the Bible, but occasionally we like to go out to eat. And here we are in Denny's talking about suffering in Psalm 23. Now, Psalm 23, even if you're here and you've never been to church, you've probably heard this psalm. It's probably the most popular chapter in the Bible. It's so popular, it's the gangster's psalm. You know the song, Gangster's Paradise? As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I take a look at my life and realize there's nothing left. Well, Coolio loves it, and I guarantee you will as well. Psalm 23 has been number one on the charts for a very long time. It's because it's a literary masterpiece. You could, you could be in a secular university and study Psalm 23 because it just resonated with people for generations. And the reason I think it's so uh, compelling is it's because it's a re- reflection of the reality that life has a lot of ups and downs, doesn't it? You might be at an up, you might be at a down, Psalm 23 is for you. And the good news of this psalm is that in the ups, in the downs, in the green pastures, in the dark valleys, you got the same shepherd clinging to you the whole time. And David had that experience in his life, didn't he? I mean, you know the story of David in the Old Testament. That brother has some ups and some downs. Some ups included, remember he was the shepherd in the field, and God said, the next king of Israel is in David's family. And so Samuel, who's going to anoint the next king of Israel, shows up at David's house and was like, I need to see all your sons to find out who the next king is. And all of David's brothers come out, right? And this is like some good-looking guys, right? you got these Brad Pitt-looking brothers, these Denzel Washington-looking brothers coming out. And Samuel's like, no, not him. No, not him. And David shows up, and God's like, that's the next king. Why? He's a man after God's own heart. How would you like God to say that about you? That's a pretty high high. And then he beats Goliath. Pretty high, high. Then he takes Israel to the pinnacle of its history as an ancient nation. Pretty high, high. But then, man, there's some low lows, right? His best friend, Jonathan, dies. He spends years running from Saul, who's trying to kill him. He sleeps with another man's wife and kills that man and covers it up. His infant son dies, and it's his fault. His daughter is raped. It's quite a journey of life, isn't it? And what I want to share with you is that what sustained David can also sustain you. A lot of people know this psalm, but very few understand it, and even few apply it. And so my encouragement is let's apply this text. Here's the one point I want you to get. If you leave saying this, we won. Here it is. Cling to the shepherd. Cling to the shepherd of Psalm 23. That's the one thing. Let's jump in. Verse 1 of Psalm 23. Famous line. The Lord is my shepherd. Now let's start with this term Lord. It's actually the Hebrew word Yahweh. That's the Hebrew word for God. Now the word Yahweh carries a ton of weight in the Old Testament. The term Yahweh was considered so reverent, so holy, that when Jewish transcribers would, would write the Old Testament text and transcribe it or, or copy it so they can multiply it. They would write the text, these verses, like in Psalm 23, but they would stop when they got to the word Yahweh. And before they wrote Yahweh, they would go take a bath because they considered themselves unclean. So they would wash themselves clean, throw away the first pen, get a brand new pen, gently, reverently write the term Yahweh, throw the pen away, bathe again, and then continue writing. That's how much reverence there was for this God. Why? Because he's the sustainer and creator of the universe. That's what Yahweh means. Yahweh is the one who is utterly independent, the one in which every human being, every living thing relies on for existence. That's the Lord that David's referencing here. And I really think, man, I really think in our American culture, we just have no category for the glory and wonder that these people had for the creator of the universe. We tend to be so casual about God. 
They're like, God's my buddy. God's my boy. But you go to Exodus 33, and this same term, Yahweh, is used to describe God in Exodus 33. And in that scene, Moses is on the top of Mount Sinai. You remember that scene? Israel has just escaped Egypt. And Moses is talking to God. And if there's anyone who's buddies with God, it's Moses, right? I mean, they hung out at the burning bush. He helped God with the whole plagues thing. You'd think there'd be some casual relationship. No! There is a reverence, even a fear of God. Moses says to God in Exodus 23, Yahweh, can I just see you? I just want to see your glory, just for a moment. You know what God says? No. Because if you saw me, you would surely die. Just seeing him would kill you, incinerate you. You know what God says? Here's what I'll do, Moses. You hide in this little crack in the rock, and I'll cover you with my hand. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass by this mountain, and I'll let you see the trail of my glory. That's what happens. Moses sees the very trail of the glory of God, and he comes down Mount Sinai with his face shining so radiantly that as he descends the mountain, all the people of Israel scream in terror, avoiding Moses because they're so afraid of the reflection of the glory, no, the reflection of the trail end of the glory of God. That is the Yahweh in Psalm 23. The Lord. If the presence of God were to come in this room right now, you would die. Be like if the sun came in this room right now. We need to have that sense of reverence of the Psalm Psalm 23 if we're going to understand the rest of the text. It's kind of like, uh, you guys ever seen the the movie Lion King? Of course you have. Everyone's seen Lion King. You remember that scene in the movie where the the hyenas are talking with Scar and... uh, yeah, you just gave it away. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, they're, um, the Whoopi Goldberg hyena is like, them, the name Mufasa is just powerful. She's like, I just hear the name and I shudder. Ooh, Mufasa. And the other hyena is like, Mufasa. And she's like, ooh, say it again, say it again, Mufasa. Right? And that is a little glimpse of how we should feel When we say, Yahweh, God, do you have that sense of reverence before him? Fear even. His holiness, his power, his majesty. You can't even look at the sun. What makes you think you're going to stand before the creator of the sun? We should shudder at the name, the Lord. In fact, you know, James 2 says that the demons hear the name of God and they shudder. They, they, they're in terror at the name of God. Now, you understand, this is who we're talking about. What does David say about this Yahweh? I mean, I just want you to look at this juxtaposition. This is so good. Yahweh, the Lord, is what? My shepherd. What a combo, huh? He's my shepherd. David emphasizes the, the, the pronoun my here because he's not just the general shepherd of the collective flock. He's not just our shepherd. He's mine too. He's your shepherd. Like Sheree, God says, I shepherd you. Russ, God shepherds you. Sophia, you are a sheep of the shepherd, your personal shepherd. Is that not a wild thought? The God in Exodus 33 who would incinerate us with a look says, I'm your shepherd. Now, shepherding in ancient Israel is probably similar to what it is today, pretty not glamorous. In fact, in ancient societies, it was the lowest job you could have. If a family needed a shepherd, it was always the youngest son, the lowest son. 
or perhaps even a servant or slave. Why? Because shepherds would live with the sheep 24 hours a day. It's a full-time job, man. And you're taking care of feeding them, cleaning them. Day and night, summer, winter, fair weather, foul weather, nourishing, guiding, protecting these sheep. It was not a fun job. You ever go to an animal, animal farm? I took my son to the animal farm the other day. You know, it's all fun. We bring them to the sheep. And we, I just was like standing by the sheep. And I'm like, hey, son, look, it's a sheep. And as I said that, the sheep decided to diarrhea everywhere. I was like, let's go check out the chicken, son. It is not fun. Can you imagine taking care of that thing 24 hours a day? And not just that. Sheep are stupid, man. They just look dumb. Bah! Like, couldn't you have a better noise? Who in their right mind would choose to be a shepherd? Like, yeah, I want that job. God would. Yahweh would. He has stooped down to the lowest profession to care for his sheep. In fact, when Jesus comes to the earth, you know what he calls himself? God in human form says, I am the great shepherd. He says in John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay my life down for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are out of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock shepherd and his name is Jesus Christ the Bible if you want to just summarize the Bible is the story of the great shepherd stooping down to save adulterous wandering sheep like you and me and the point of this psalm is cling to that shepherd but really you look at the gospels you look at Christ you see that he's been clinging to us the whole time now if God, Yahweh, is the shepherd, what does that make us? Sheep, right? Which is so lame, isn't it? Like, can we pick a better animal than that one? You know, maybe an eagle, they have talons, they fly. I would pick, you know, Siberian white tiger, because that's just the coolest animal. They're white tigers, it's really cool. You ever play that game with kids? Like, if you could be any animal, what would you be? No kid ever says sheep. Why? Because they can't do anything cool. Like, if, if someone attacks them, the worst thing, the best thing they can do is say, bah, like, what? they're lame animals. You know, sheep are one of the only animals in the world that require a caretaker to survive. Because on their own, I mean, pretty much any predator will just destroy, wipe them out. And so, by God calling himself the shepherd and us, his children, the sheep, he is saying, we are helpless. We are completely reliant on him to protect, serve, and save us, or else the wolves got us. And I, you got to understand that the picture of you in the Bible is not a hawk soaring over the clouds. It's not, you're not a lion, king of the jungle. You're a dumb sheep grazing in a field, just buying at every potential threat, hopeless unless someone feeds, protects you. And this theme of helplessness is just prevalent throughout the psalm and the scriptures. You know, that's why Psalm 23, do you, do you recognize? There are no imperatives in Psalm 23. There are no commands. There's no do's and don'ts. Because sheep can't do anything. The only imperative is just look at the shepherd and trust in him. And David doesn't waste any verses saying, hey, here's five steps of getting through the valleys of your life, or here's, here's how you be a, 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 live a full life as a sheep and protect yourself against your own wolves. No, no, no. You're helpless. The shepherd's there to help you. Cling to him. And this begs a question for us. Why would Yahweh, the being who is supreme over everything in creation, who made everything, why would he stoop down to care for sheep like us? Why does he do that? Look at verses 2 and 3. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Man, that's pretty great. God does some pretty spectacular stuff for me. It sounds like God is pretty into me. He's leading me to nice sights, still waters, nice pastures. He's, he thinks I'm pretty great, doesn't he? It's in the text. Well, let's keep going. What is the motive of all this shepherding care, all of this leading, restoring shepherding? Look at the end of verse 3. He does all this for who? For his name's sake. For his name's sake. And you have to understand that God does not care about you because you are so awesome. He cares for you because it is in his very nature to love unlovable things. To restore rebellious people back to himself. The motivation of his shepherd and care is his own renown, his own glory, his own fame. Wait, wait, God doesn't love me because I'm awesome? I mean, in our culture, that's the message you constantly receive, isn't it? Like, if you didn't make the team, or if you didn't make varsity, it's the coach's fault. Or if you're failing out of second grade, well, it's your teacher's fault. And we're going to just push you on to the next grade anyway because you're not a failure. You're special. Any sort of pointing out of your growth areas is a slap in your perfectly unique and beautiful face. You're a snowflake. You can do no wrong. But that's not the image you get of yourself in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say God's like, oh man, these people, these sheep, they're so wonderful. I can't just get enough of them. No, the Bible says these people are, are enemies, they're evil at heart, but I can't help but to, to give myself to love and restore and protect and save them, despite themselves. The Bible depicts a God who is about God, not about you. And that's a good thing because God elevates the most important thing in the universe, the most beautiful thing in the universe, and it's not you, it's Him. You can't bear the weight of being the most important thing in the universe. Then God, He's not looking at you saying, I just can't get enough of them, because you're just not that great, and I'm not either. He cares, He shepherds, not because you're good, but because He's good. Now, that doesn't mean he's, He doesn't love you. God does love you more than you can imagine. But he doesn't love you because you merited that love. He loves you because it's in his nature to save broken things, broken people. The Bible is packed with examples of this. Let me show you what I mean. Do you know in Isaiah 43, God says to Israel, everyone I created, I created for what? For my glory. So Isaiah 49, God called Israel for his glory. Psalm 106 Israel says, we have sinned, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedness, and God rescued Israel from Egypt for his glory. In fact, later on in Romans 9, which is, if you think God's really impressed and love you, loves you just for who you are, don't read Romans 9, because that'll mess up with your whole worldview. In Romans 9, it says, God raised up Pharaoh and condemned him for his own glory and purposes in the universe. Ezekiel 20, God defeated Pharaoh at the Red Sea, it says, to show his glory. Not because Israel was so wonderful. God spared Israel in the wilderness for the glory of his name, it says. God gave Israel victory in Canaan for the glory of his name. In fact, he tells Israel, I'm not giving you victory because you guys are great. I'm giving you victory because I'm great. You guys are a stiff-necked, rebellious people. I want to pour my wrath out on you. But I withheld my hand and acted for the sake of my name, he says. God gave uh, Israel victory over the Philistines and established a temple in Israel for the glory of his name, 2 Samuel 7 says. 1 Samuel 12, God did not cast out his people for the glory of his name. Ezekiel 36, God restored Israel from exile for the glory of his name. And you're like, well, that's God in the Old Testament. God in the Old Testament is just a little angry. He didn't, he didn't have breakfast. He didn't get a nap. God in the New Testament, Jesus is way nicer. He's really into me in the New Testament. You guys ever heard that phrase like, if I was the only person in the world, Jesus still would have come to the earth and died for me alone because I'm that special. That sounds nice, except it's not in the Bible anywhere. And the theme of God being about himself continues in the New Testament. John 7, 18, Jesus sought the glory of his Father in all that he did. Matthew 5, 16 and 1 Peter 2, 12 say, Jesus tells us to do good works, 
for the glory of his name. I just keep going. John 14, 13. Jesus said he answers prayer for the glory of God's name. John 12 and John 17. Jesus endures the final hours of suffering for the glory of God. John 16, 14. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Son of God. In fact, you read the epistles. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. I mean, you ever think about the magnitude of that verse? Whatever you do, do it for Him. How do you sleep to the glory of God? How do you snack to the glory of God? How do you play pickleball to the glory of God? I don't know, but that's how much God cares about His name and His glory. It's all about Him, not even a little bit about you. 2 Thessalonians 1, it says Jesus is coming back for you. No, for the glory of His name. John 17, Jesus' ultimate aim for us is that we see and enjoy the glory of God. Romans 11, everything happens for the glory of God. You read Habakkuk 2.14, it says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I don't know if you've ever been to the sea, but it's a lot of water. That's how invested God is in His own glory, His own name. And we reach the end of the Bible, Revelation 21, the last chapter, and it says, the sun will be, be replaced by the glory of the Lord. That sustains us now, not the sun. God, it's all about His name. His glory. So why does He shepherd you and me? For His name. He doesn't love you because you're good. He loves you because He's that good. Just in his character. And you just see that in the life of David, right? Like, we think about David. Yeah, God couldn't help but save David. He was pretty awesome, right? No, this was a horrible human being. The guy writing this psalm, he slept with another man's wife, sent him out to war, and killed that man. That is an objectively horrible thing to do, an objectively horrible person. And the scriptures say, so are we. God doesn't look at me and say, oh, how wonderful. Little Adam Mutasib, he just gets so excited on stage. You know, I made his nostrils a little too big, but his heart's as pure as gold. No! On my own, the scriptures say, I deserve nothing of the shepherding care of God. Because I have made myself his enemy through my sin. I've run from him. You might be here this morning and think, I've got it together in life. I've got this degree. I've got this promotion. I own this business. I got these kids. I got these grades. I got these friends. I own this house. Before God, you are not special to him. Before God, you're an enemy, a sinner. I mean, Revelation 6 says this. It talks about how when God is going to return and judge even the best people on earth, we are going to cower in fear. Because of all our sin. It says, this is describing the judgment that will come through Jesus one day. Revelation 6. When he opened the sixth seal, when Jesus opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. Verse 13. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. This is the judgment of God. Listen to this. Verse 15. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones, who? The very best of the earth. The generals, the rich, the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand before him? Who can stand before the glory of the God of Exodus 33? No one, not even the best of the world. I just need you to understand what the scriptures say. You are not celebrated and unique and beautiful as you are before God. You have made yourself an enemy through your sin. And God does not save you because of how special you are. He saves you because it is in his very nature to love unlovable people. So that at the end of time, the universe could step back and look at the timeline of of eternity and say, what a great shepherd. 
He chose us. He called us. He justified us. He glorified us. And I did nothing to earn any of it. He's that good. That's the God of Psalm 23 and Exodus 33. And what is David's response to this? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You want a challenging verse for yourself this morning. That is it. The Lord's my shepherd. I don't want anything else. Essentially what it's saying. Isn't that refreshing to be around somebody who's like, yeah, I'm good. I don't need anything. The best kind of guests I have in my home, I'm like, hey, you want a drink? Can I get you anything? No, I'm good. I'm just happy to be here. That's the Christian life. No, I'm good. I don't need anything. I'm just happy to be here. The Lord's my shepherd. Basically, what David is saying is, if this Yahweh, if this God really has chosen to save me despite myself and shepherd me throughout the journey of life, there really is nothing else in this world I need. Is that the state of your heart this morning? Could you say what David is saying here? I mean, just imagine for a moment, a genie sprung up. I'm Middle Eastern, so we're going to go with genie. You rub the lamp, and the genie sprung up this morning and said, all right, any wish you want, it's yours. You want a wife? You want better kids? You want a better church? You want a better house? Anything you want. Are you at such a place of contentment in Christ that when the genie says, what's your wish, you could say, I'm good. I don't need anything. That is the kind of contentment and joy available to those in the shepherding care of God. I think there's a reason, I think the reason that there's so many unhappy people in this city, in this country, perhaps even in this room, is because you want too many things. And depression is the gap between your expectations and reality. And usually there's a pretty big gap. And the solution to contentment really is wanting less things. Actually, it's just wanting one thing, the shepherd. Is he all you want today? I just want more of you this morning, God. I want to know you more and the power of your resurrection. I want to walk with you. I want a, French, a fresh uh, receiving of your, of your grace and intimacy, God. Is that where you are today? Could you imagine with me a church that's like all we want is God? All we want is the great shepherd. Like we don't care what kind of hip venue we have. We don't care what the seats, how comfortable they are. We don't care about the coffee, which we don't care about the coffee anyway because it's bad, but you get over it. We don't care. If, I don't care if someone says hi to me or not. I just want the shepherd. I don't care who's speaking this morning. I just want to hear from the shepherd. I don't care who's leading music this morning. I just want to sing to my shepherd. Do you have that kind of, when you came in this morning, were you like, I need nothing from any human being. I don't need anything from this experience, that it's this, you know, this service. I just want him. Just God, give me more of you. Is that how you came in? I think the reason so many people are so discontent with church is because they don't give a rip about the shepherd. They want the many shepherds to meet all their needs. They want the congregation to meet all their needs. They want their gospel community to meet all their needs. Really, your issue, you're just not content with the, the Yahweh of Exodus 33. So you need other lesser things that will never satisfy you to fill the gap in your soul. And you can go from church to church or people to people or religion to religion, and you're going to be in the same place. Discontent until you find contentment in that shepherd. Do you have that kind of contentment? Could you say to the Lord today, God, take my health, take my money, take my business, take my friends, take my promotion, take my family, take anything you want. Literally, the only thing I need is you. And until you do that, until you can say what David says here in Psalm 23, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You are going to battle anxiety, frustration, disappointment for the rest of your life. 
This is why when you hang out with Christians from other countries, they're just happier people. I have a friend named Cam Bees who's a pastor in Iran. Christianity is, is illegal in Iran. He started a church. He actually came to Christ through a dream. Believed the gospel, became a pastor of a church. The church was like 20 people. So imagine like just one row, basically, in a room, small room in a house. And this is what they did for church. They locked the doors. They hid the Bibles under the furniture because Bibles were illegal. Christianity was illegal. And they would just open up the Bible and read it, and they would do a little mini message. And whenever there was a noise outside the house, they would shake in terror and, and hide the Bibles because they knew that Christianity was legal. And any moment, the police could come in and arrest all of them. And you just go to these gatherings in Iran, in Kenya, in China. These people are so easy to please. You just open up the Bible. They're like, oh, this is awesome. Sing a song. This is amazing. We don't have any instruments. We're just going to vocally sing. We're just going to pray for two hours. Yeah, I'm good with that. Why? Why are they so content, so happy? Because the shepherd's enough. You think at Kambiz's gatherings in Iran, these church gatherings, you think they're like, who's speaking today? Oh, it's Ahmed. We're not going. He's not very good. Is, well, Ahmed is boring. <laughs> no. You think they're like, I wonder what the coffee's like there in Iran. No. They just want the shepherds. So, I'm going to be honest with you. If you are here this morning and you're coming because of the music, if you're coming because of the speaker, if you're coming because of the community, if you're coming because of the venue and the amenities, you're not coming for God, you're coming for you. You're coming to be entertained. And that does not glorify God. That is not, it's not pleasing in His sight. What is pleasing if he, his, for Him is if you say, I just want Him. You can take everything else. Honestly, if I was like, all right, this morning, no music, no chairs, no sermon, no activities, no community, what we're going to do is just sit on the floor and I'm going to read the book of Romans. Would you be like, that's awesome. If I was like, hey, we're not going to do anything else. We're just going to pray for an hour. Just fall on our knees and pray for an hour. Just talk to the shepherd. Would you be like, man, this is great. And the reality is so many wouldn't. Because they're not coming to church for the shepherd. They're coming for them. I'll be honest with you, I bet a lot of your guys' faith would crumble if you were in Iran. Because there, there aren't charismatic speakers. There's no safe venues. There's no coffee. It's Jesus. It's the shepherd. That's all you got. See enough. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He continues in verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? The shepherd's with me. Your rod and your staff, they come from me. So the picture we get as David continues the psalm is the shepherd leading his flock on a journey. This is kind of an illustration of your life. You're on a journey. And in the journey, you're going through green pastures, through some still waters. Oh, that's peaceful. That's serene. That's nice. But at times, we go through valleys that David says, are as dark as death. Now, shepherds leading their flock to a new destination would often have to lead their sheep through dangerous terrain, like deep ravines or dark valleys. And in the, in the ravines, if you make one wrong step, you fall, you're dead. All the sheep are dead. Or if you go through the dark valley, there, it was out of the light. So oftentimes there would be uh, enemies, wolves lurking in the darkness, ready to attack the helpless sheep. And what David is saying is life is a lot like this journey of the shepherd leading his sheep. You got some green pastures, but you have some really dark, dangerous ravines and valleys. David had a lot of moments like that, didn't he? Saul chasing him. Absalom, his own son, trying to kill him, take his kingdom. And so it is for us. You will, I promise you, you will have some dark, dark valleys and some really green pastures. What comforts David in both terrains? Is it the simplicity of the journey or the safety of the journey or the 
anything else? No, it's just that the shepherd is there through it all. Why can he, as he, as he says, fear no evil, even when the enemies are lurking in the darkness, or the ravines are steep enough to kill you? Middle of verse 4, he says, for you are with me. And what I want you to know this morning is that true peace is not found in the absence of pain. It is found in the presence of God. You can be in any setting in the world, but if God is with you, you can be more at peace than if you were alone in the greatest of pastures. True peace is not found in the absence of pain, but in the presence of the great shepherd. Why does David fear nothing even when the, the enemies lurk and the ravines are steep? Even when the pain is unbearable and life is just a jumbled up mess? Is it because the pain is going to end soon? No. Is it because it's not as bad as people said it would be? No. Is it because this valley will never happen again? No, there will probably be more valleys. He has the shepherd with him. The shepherd's strong presence is a comfort to his sheep. And even more importantly, the shepherd was the one who led the sheep into that valley. We can be confident in our valleys because we know it was the Lord himself that brought us there. The shepherd never misleads his flock. And God has not promised you a valley-free life. He has promised you will experience deep pain in this life. But he does promise, I will be with you to the end of the journey. And the more narrow and dangerous the path, the closer the sheep need to cling to the shepherd. Now, why are the sheep safe in the care of the shepherd? Well, David says he's got two tools that's helping me. He's got his rod and he's got his staff. God rolls deep out here. He's got his rod. The rod was a defensive tool that the shepherd would wear on his belt. And any enemy or, or wolf that would attack, he would pull out the rod and beat the heck out of them. Get out of here. Scatter. And he had his staff. The staff was a long stick with a rounded hook. And if the sheep was wandering away from the flock, the great shepherd would go after the one that left the 99 and pull him back into the collective flock. You're not going anywhere. You're one of mine. These tools comfort David. There's no enemy that can touch me when my shepherd has his rod. And there's no path I can wander off to away because the shepherd has his staff. And I want to comfort you with this reality that in life's deepest valleys, the shepherd is not far off, way ahead, saying, come on, catch up. You know the way. The shepherd is near, rod and staff ready, side by side with you, leading you. And a shepherd leading his sheep through a dangerous valley filled with enemies is either really stupid or really confident. And we can rest assured that our God is confident that he will lead us through the valley. And what's so interesting to me about this section of Psalm 23 is that, notice the, the psalm shifts in pronouns in verse 4. In verses 1 through 3, David said, he makes me lie down, he leads me, he restores my soul. You almost get the sense that in the beginning of the, of the section, David's talking about God. But verse 4 on, when David's in the valley near the ravines, he starts saying, you, not he. You are with me. Your rod, your staff comfort me. Why doesn't David keep the same pronouns? He, he is with me. His rod, his staff comfort me. Like the rest of the psalm. It's because in the valley, it's almost like this shift. David starts to stop talking about God and begins talking to God. Because valleys have the unique purpose of bringing you closer to the great shepherd in a way the green pasture never could. You just get this sense, David is in the valley, the pain is unbearable, his infant daughter has died, his best friend has died, his son is betraying him, and he stops saying, he, 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 God is, God, and he starts saying, God, you, I need you right now, you're with me right now, your rod and staff comfort me right now, you're going to lead me home. And so, can I just encourage you, as you are in a valley like David, you have a choice in your suffering, you can either... Get embittered and start talking about God like he and distance yourself and be mad at God for the suffering he's allowed in your life. Or you can begin saying you and become even closer, more intimate with God in the valley as he clings tightly to you. And the good news of this verse, of this, of this chapter is found in verse 4 where he says, 
through. God, the shepherd, leads me through the valley of the shadow of death. Notice God doesn't lead us to the valley of the shadow of death. He leads us through it. Why? Because we ain't staying there. We gone. The valley is temporary. And for the Christian, suffering is not your destination. It's your detour. Pain, death, suffering is not a period for the Christian. It's a semicolon. As surely as God has led us into the valley, He will lead us through the valley. And consider this question. Why would a good shepherd lead his sheep through a dangerous valley, knowing it will cause them pain? Isn't the only possible answer to get to a better place? Because through the valley and ravine is the eternal pasture we will never leave. And I want to encourage you today that no matter what valley you have faced or are facing, the valley makes way to the pasture. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, one day you won't just face the valley of the shadow of death, you will face death itself. You know, Jewish scholars say that in Exodus 33, you know when God says, you can't see my face, Moses, and live. The reason why God said that, they say, isn't because just seeing God will kill you. The reason God says, Moses, you can't see my face and live is because the extreme difference between God's utter holiness and Moses and our utter sinfulness is too extreme that seeing both together would incinerate and destroy Moses. It'd be like uh, if the room was completely pitch bar- dark and someone turned the lights on. You're like, oh my gosh, why do we suddenly act like we got shot when that happens? Like, oh, it's so bright. That is just a little picture of what happens when you as a sinful human being, me as a sinful human being, stand before the, the glory and radiance of the perfect creator of the universe. And what Psalm 23 is hinting at is that Everyone won't just go through the valley of the shadow of death. They will enter into death and face the God of Exodus 33. And the contrast of His holiness and our sin will strike us like a gunshot to the heart. And before the creator of the universe, God will say, You are guilty, deserving of staying in the valley of the shadow of death forever. But the gospel is that Psalm 23 points to Jesus, the great shepherd, who didn't just enter into the valley of death for us, he entered into death for us. He beat the, the wolves of sin and death with his rod of righteousness and the cross. And now if you are in Christ, your, sh- your valleys of death are just shadows leading you to the great eternal pasture. And so our, we implore you as followers of Jesus, go to the great shepherd, let him face the enemy, let him face the valley for you, the biggest valley you could ever face, sin and death. Come to him, cling to him, and receive eternal life. And then David ends this psalm with a promise to all who come to Christ. Verse 5. This metaphor shifts, actually. Uh, It went from a shepherd leading his flock to now one of greater intimacy. Now it's a metaphor of of a host planning a party, which I like. Verse 5, David says of the great shepherd who is now a host, to all who make it through the journey to the end of the end of the journey, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. That is the end of the journey for the Christian. It looks like God hosting a meal. There lies before David a well-set table. God anoints David's head with oil, which, to be honest, doesn't sound very pleasant to me, but apparently it was a thing in, in like the 6th century B.C. Basically, uh, anointing someone's head with oil was like God saying, Welcome, you're accepted here. David says, that at this table, my cup overflows. So basically, this final banquet meal at the end of the journey looks a little bit like fogo de chow. And the light is always green. Keep bringing the meat. I want it all. Endless refills. My cup overflows. And I know this isn't the case, but it almost feels like God's a bit of a sore winner because I'm eating this amazing meal at the end of this journey, and it says that we're parting in front of our enemies, in the presence of our enemies. It's almost like he's like making them watch me have a great time. 
We made it through. You didn't strike us down. You didn't beat us. And I'm enjoying fogo de chow in your face. This is the victory available to those in Christ. And then David writes in verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now, that is an incredibly encouraging verse that David concludes with. And it's a little obscured by the English word follow. Because when you think goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, it kind of feels like goodness and mercy will trail behind me and never quite catch up to me. Which is not very comforting. Surely goodness and mercy will lag behind me all the days of my life. Eh, okay. But the Hebrew word for this word follow is, is actually much more encouraging. It more accurately means goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. David is saying God's goodness, God's mercy will chase after me and never let me go for all the days of my life until I reach this final dinner table where God is my host and my enemies get to watch me have a great meal. And has that not been the case for those of, us, those of us in Christ? Not only has our biggest valley, our biggest danger been thwarted by Christ, but just following Him, knowing Him, walking with Him, abiding in His commands in the Scriptures, doesn't it just feel like life makes so much more sense? Goodness and mercy just chases after you. I mean, you just look at my life before I was a Christian. It was a mess. I have friends from college come and gather here and, and watch the service, and I kind of get a little embarrassed, like, hey, don't tell anyone else what I used to be like, because it was not pretty, right? And you just see my life before and after Jesus, it's like, it feels like God's just smacking me in the face with all this goodness and mercy. My finances were a mess before I came to Christ. My relationships were a mess before I came to Christ. I was a mess before I came to Christ. It just feels like, boom, 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 boom. I don't just get Jesus. I get the creator just overflowing me with blessing and blessing. And this is the promise. Goodness and mercy will chase you and never let you go if you're in Christ. Like this little guy. He's just going to chase you all the way through. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, this promise is not for you. You will not just face the shadow of death. You will face death. You will face the God of Exodus 33. And you will stand naked and be condemned. And the invitation is come to him this morning. Receive the blessing of Jesus chasing you forever. And the promise at the end of verse 6. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I don't know about you, but I'd be pretty content at God's house forever. And that's where we're headed. So I can endure some valleys. Until we get there. Let's come to him today. Let's trust in him today. Hey, here's some good news. You don't have to do anything. Just go to the shepherd. Let him do the work. That's the promise of Psalm 23. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I know there are people in this room that aren't following you, that don't know you. We're so glad they're here. And, and Lord, I just pray that you would would convict their heart to help them see that their brokenness. Like we all have. There's no one here. We're all messed up. And I pray that they would see the beauty of Jesus Christ, the great shepherd this morning. And they would cling to him, surrender to him, follow him. And that your goodness and mercy would chase after them all the days of their life. Because things seem to get in sync when we're connected to our creator. And they seem to be quite a mess when we go our own way. Help us to come to you today. And I pray for the Christians in the room. May we all be content with just you as our shepherd. Take, take it all, God. We don't need it. Really, you are the one thing we need. And I pray we would live with that reality in our life. I pray we would not fl fl flip out when things don't go our way. I pray we would not be overcome with discouragement. When things don't go our way. But we would say the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Everything I have is everything. Everything I need is what I have. Help us to be these kind of believers God. Psalm 23 Christians. We pray in Jesus name. Amen.